I want to acknowledge our university and community sponsors and supporters, the University of Iowa International's program and the University of Iowa's Honors program. They contribute vital time, talent, and logistics to our organization. I also thank the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization for their financial support. And I thank today's special financial uh, support sponsors, Mike Margolin and Jane McEwen. Our programs are made possible by the fina financial support of these sponsors. At this point, I am pleased to introduce Christopher Squire, a member of our program committee of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Co uh, Committee, who will introduce Dr. Oral. Thank you, Janice. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce my friend, colleague, um, Dr. Resmier Oral. Um, Dr. Oral is a clinical professor of pediatrics and director of the Child Protection Program at the University of Iowa Children's Hospital. She's a board certified expert in child abuse pediatrics, having completed her fellowship at The Ohio State University. She became involved with child abuse and neglect in 1993 and established the first multidisciplinary child abuse follow-up team in her native Turkey. She subsequently wrote a book on child abuse for Turkish physicians. She co-authored training kits that have been published by The Ohio State University, and her interests are in building international systems to address child abuse, neglect, and drug-endangered children, shaken baby syndrome, and early intervention to prevent child abuse. She's been instrumental in building programs in other countries, including Turkey, Portugal, Colombia, Greece, and Pakistan. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Oral. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for these lovely introductions and uh, inviting me to present here. I must say this group uh, and the presentations that I had the privilege of listening to uh, through these meetings is one of the most impressive groups in uh, the intellectual life of Iowa City. Um, I am originally from Turkey. Uh, as you heard, I moved to the United States in 1998 uh, at age 38, uh, looking for uh, a new path uh, uh, in academic life. And child abuse and neglect is a boring, depressive uh, <laughs> field, obviously. So whenever I can, I just put myself out into the nature. And this is from Yosemite. Uh, which I visited three times, by the way. So when I uh, was hired by the University of Iowa to establish the child protection program here, um, among multiple uh, items in our mission, one was professional education, especially in uh, developing countries, with a focus on Turkey, of course, because I was already feeling guilty having left Turkey when Turkey was in need of uh, child abuse prevention services. With that goal, I reached out uh, to my colleagues in Turkey that I already knew from uh, several universities, Gazi University and Ankara University. And I considered collaboration with the Turkish Society for the Prevention of Child Abuse and Neglect. And I kind of dreamed whether it could be possible to collaborate with the Turkish government ever. Um, so those were uh, in my mind. And uh, with that, the work evolved in such a way that uh, it wasn't confined to Turkey anymore. And I got connected with other countries, Portugal, uh, one, Pakistan, uh, through my uh, work in the uh, international societies and uh, Greece, and finally in 2014, uh, Colombia, the countries that I have uh, the greatest uh, connection with uh, in my work. When I started working, even in Turkey, because it had been three years uh, since I had left Turkey when I went back to start a collaboration there, I figured out very soon that I had to start with the question of what can I learn from you. 
because I was going in those countries as a uh, stranger. And once I learned uh, the basics of the country, the next question would be, how may I help you? And as we started dancing this way, we constantly went back to what else can I learn from you and what else can I help you with? Uh, and this dance um, uh, proved to be uh, successful in Turkey um, to a great extent, which I would like to share with you. So this work was extremely humbling for me, even for Turkey, because when I first started, I considered, I'm Turkish, I know this country, and I was ready to teach. But I figured out right away, no, it doesn't work that way. So respect at every turn, uh, allowing the local collaborators to be the drivers for the country, what they want to do. And as the international collaborator, um, being as humble as possible in providing whatever guidance I could provide to them. And learning the local culture, social, political, uh, professional, uh, proved to be extremely important. In Turkey, I knew those uh, nuances pretty well, but in other countries, um, it was a very exciting learning experience. So um, <clears throat> with mutual uh, idea exchanges in Turkey, our decisions uh, turned out to be we needed to establish more hospital-based multidisciplinary teams and expand it over time to community-based interagency collaboration, bringing governmental agencies um, uh, to the table. Uh, and focusing on forensic interview and finally starting to think about a national plan for child abuse and neglect management and prevention uh, in the country. And uh, this worked uh, very well and we started organizing multiple uh, training activities, a national conference every year um, coupled with uh, a number of uh, local regional uh, training activities. Focus was Ankara because it was the capital and with my ultimate goal of reaching to the government and policy makers, I wanted my focus to be uh, Ankara and the most advanced teams started emerging from Ankara as well on a hospital uh, base as too. So my secondary focus uh, was the other two large metropoles in the country, Izmir, my hometown, and Istanbul. Um, and uh, peripheral uh, provinces also proved to be very helpful uh, to focus on because they were small, because all the agency representatives knew one another personally. Sometimes it was much easier to establish a program in a small town rather than struggling with the enormous Istanbul uh, politics. And as a result of this, in the first several years, four visiting professors came to the UI Child Protection Program. And this is the test question, Istanbul. Uh, nobody should die without seeing Istanbul, by the way. <clears throat> so in Portugal, also starting from 2010, we held multiple conferences and uh, courses. Uh, in Greece, in 2011, actually, uh, I was a part of a regional uh, symposium, uh, but now I'm a Fulbright scholar, thanks to my uh, dear friend, Karen Walksmith, who encouraged me to do that. And in 2016, I'm going back to Greece for probably a decade-long uh, work uh, followed with the Fulbright um, program. Uh, Pakistan and Colombia also through educational or research activities uh, I got involved with. Um, Provost Global Forum in 2014 um, pretty much uh, tied up all my work in the international arena. Uh, I was very lucky to be awarded um, uh, this opportunity by the international programs and I brought all the representatives from all these countries uh, to the Global Forum, uh, which pretty much sealed our uh, collaboration. So in my learning from my hosts, I learned the strong links 
uh, of the systems in every country. In Turkey, it was different. Uh, the, um, the cultural uh, climate was extremely important. For instance, Ankara would lead, Istanbul would tackle because they wanted to be the number one, which they had already missed. Izmir was very nurturing and supportive. <laughs> I'm from Izmir, I'm proud of that. Um, and uh, systems building via uh, university uh, hospital-based uh, MDTs with the hope of a collaboration with the government was very viable uh, in Turkey. In Portugal, on the other hand, a forensic medicine group found me in Turkey uh, in a conference and we started uh, working together. Again, Porto was the leader, Coimbra was very supportive, but the Lisbon people were just like Istanbulites and they were, no, we're not going to play. Um, and uh, Institute of Legal Medicine, which is a forensic medicine institution in uh, Portugal, was the leader of all of this work. So I was learning uh, as I went to every country. Uh, Pakistan, on the other hand, um, all the work was basically on the shoulders of a very strong pediatric NGO. And they were trying to uh, resolve all the issues Pakistan was dealing with, uh, child abuse and neglect, because the government was not supporting uh, child abuse at all. Um, in Greece, uh, very strong research bases and funding stream through EU uh, was great strength. Uh, and government and NGO partnerships were just uh, evolving. And this last time when I uh, visited them in November, I, uh, I saw that there was significant uh, improvement in that regard. In Colombia, again, NGO leadership was extremely uh, strong with international uh, funding. And I'm looking forward to working with them in 2017. So with all this, I came to accept the fact that the local resources are not going to be what I'm hoping them to be so that we can move forward. And I had to understand systems may be available or not available. Politics may or may not be involved. And you have to go around politics to be able to uh, move forward. And people's priorities, individuals' priorities, even may not be parallel to what I perceive uh, them uh, needing to be in that particular country. But I kept my positive attitude and tried to show the local collaborators what may and perhaps should lie ahead and how we can work together toward that goal one step at a time. So that was extremely important. Whenever I showed them two steps ahead, uh, they were, oh, we can't do that. But if we focused on the next step, then there was always um, a good collaboration. So as a result, in Turkey, more than 10,000 uh, professionals were trained over, um, over a decade uh, from multiple disciplines, as you see here. And overall, uh, eight faculty, six from Turkey, uh, one from Portugal and Colombia each, uh, came and trained uh, at the UI Child Protection Program. And all of these individuals uh, became leaders in the country, which the country was uh, sorely, especially Turkey, was sorely lacking. Uh, regional multidisciplinary teams were established in hospitals, and Turkey now has approximately 30 multidisciplinary teams. Ministry of Health then established a network of child protection centers the way we know it in the United States. I don't know if anybody heard of child advocacy center or child protection center model that is extremely successful in addressing sexual abuse in the US, but Turkey finally established 20 of those with a goal of 29. And numerous international peer-reviewed uh, research articles have been published as well. And in all countries, professional awareness uh, soared, which I'm very happy about. So when I left Turkey in 1998, the only team uh, that was established uh, at a hospital was the team uh, from my hospital. 
And I had trained another team in the process of implementation from uh, South Central uh, Turkey. But uh, now uh, the hospital-based multidisciplinary teams are scattered all around the country to uh, approximately 30 universities and teaching hospitals. Then, in 2010, uh, by collaborating with the Ministry of Health, we established the first child protection center, and in five years, that number, um, in a couple of years, that number uh, increased to five or six, and then um, in five years, uh, the number increased to 20, as I said, uh, with a goal of uh, 29. So, Holding uh, the local pulse in the hand uh, to assess the right time to move forward proved to be extremely important in my uh, experience. While I was sharing all I had uh, with them, uh, I also had to take some pauses at times uh, and uh, in order to celebrate successes together. It's almost like experience in life in anything. So it was uh, quite uh, teaching and uh, didactic for me. Uh, I also recognize I never knew this could be possible in Turkey. I knew in America one person and one case may, can make a difference. But in Turkey that hadn't been my experience at all. But in this case it did. Um, a sex abuse scandal erupted in Turkey. A newspaper columnist uh, supporting the government sexually abused the adolescent daughter of uh, a, a cleaning lady that was cleaning his house. And because this individual was supporting the government big time, and because severe sexual abuse uh, situations, or at least high profile sexual abuse cases, are to be assessed by a governmental agency, which is called Forensic Medicine Institute, located in Istanbul. This agency, by, I'm pretty sure, orders from the Ministry of Justice under which uh, they resided, tried to cover up the sex abuse scandal and tried to clear up the sky from all charges. And we were, the country actually was extremely uh, lucky that there was a contracting child psychiatrist from a um, provincial university working at this institution uh, designated to do the forensic interview with this girl, the victim, but in the presence of some 40 adult males in an auditorium. And the child psychiatrist, of course, rebelled, and she had the opportunity to rebel as well because uh, she was a temporary person with that institution and said, I will not do it. She left the institution and went directly to the media, uh, thank goodness. And the government agenda was exposed big time. Uh, and luckily, there were two female policymakers in the uh, fundamentalist religious party, but they were relatively secular individuals. And these individuals stated, we cannot accept this. We must do something so sexual abuse can be managed appropriately. And these ladies reached out to uh, the child psychiatrist who had attended some of our training activities, connected them with my uh, major collaborator, Dr. Betul Ulukol from Ankara University Child Protection Program, who then connected these policymakers with me online. And these ladies told me they wanted to write a draft, a bill to present to the parliament uh, to uh, make sure there is a law identifying uh, the model to manage child sexual abuse in Turkey. I thought, oh my gosh, this was what I have been waiting for for years. I said, sure, I'm at your service. <laughs> and we worked, um, and uh, all uh, four of us worked together. And these ladies led us to the Ministry of Health, which had rejected working with us five, six years prior. And when the uh, parliamentarians were on board, 
uh, we were able to convince the Ministry of Health that we had to do something about this. And more than that, with Dr. Ulukol's great leadership, an interministerial higher council was established, including the Ministry of Justice, Interior, Education, Social Services, Ministry of Health, Supreme Court, etc., all key players to be able to develop a system. And uh, Dr. Ulukol testified before this council many, many times trying to sell the model, and I was lucky to be able to do the same. And eventually, Child Protection Center model was accepted by the parliament, by the Ministry of Health, and eventually, actually, uh, these uh, ladies helped us um, uh, putting the child protection model into the renewed Turkish constitution. That constitution, by the way, is a very anti-democratic constitution. Had I been in Turkey, probably I would have voted no. Uh, but this little piece of good legislation got into that constitution. So now there's no way of going back in Turkey in managing child sexual abuse, and as a result of which multiple centers have been established. Research soared in Turkey as well. As a result of all this work, all the academics were constantly doing research uh, based on their uh, systems building uh, work. Um, so there are obviously lots of work to be done, and there is a little bit of a halt in my work in Turkey uh, because of political fights between the uh, governmental system and the university system. Universities represent the more democratic, progressive uh, line. Uh, but the, govern the governmental system is representing the more effective management system of child sexual abuse. So right now, unfortunately, they're fighting a little bit of a fight, mm -hmm. and I am trying to be the neutral uh, person in guiding them so that we can start working on all these uh, issues. Um, so I'll just pass this. In Portugal, we also did a lot of good work. And right now, they are working on uh, building hospital-based multidisciplinary teams to address child abuse and neglect. In Greece, um, since my involvement in 2011, there wasn't a lot of um, progress, but two sex abuse scandals erupted in Greece as well. and. Um, new individuals, younger generation people, decided to work on child abuse and neglect, and they reached out to me. And because I'm a Fulbright scholar uh, on the roster for the next five years, uh, I decided to use my Fulbright um, scholarship uh, for three weeks in Greece uh, this coming June. <clears throat> in Pakistan, um, I am involved on an online basis. Uh, with my colleagues there, but we're constantly working on new educational uh, programs to improve professional uh, awareness there. And in Colombia, also hospital-based MDTs and uh, the prospect of doing a Fulbright scholarship period there in 2017 is also uh, an option. Here are these wonderful people who are transforming their countries, Dr. Betul Ulukol from Ankara University, Dr. Magalhães and her team from uh, Portugal, uh, Dr. Zafar uh, from Pakistan, Dr. Nicolaitis from Greece, and finally, uh, Dr. Isabel Cuadros uh, from uh, Colombia. And I'm very happy to be uh, working with them. Thank you very much. I hope I use the time. Right. First question is, can you define child protection? What does a child protection center actually do? Uh, thank you very much for this question. Child protection center model was uh, established in the U.S. out of Alabama, Huntsville, Alabama. And um, in 1970s or so, I believe. And at that time, things were managed in the U.S. exactly the same way as they were managed in Turkey. Everybody was doing their work in their own silos. 
Uh, there were lots of duplications. Children were interviewed by the doctors and nurses, social services, police, prosecutor, da da da, which is traumatic in and of itself. So a very wise prosecutor, county attorney, decided to bring all these silos together and start brainstorming. You know, this can't be done that way. Let's work together and establish a center, bring the children to the center where only one person is going to interview the child, one person is going to examine the child physically, and everybody is going to share the same information on that day. So the diagnostic process was um, developed into a very seamless, smooth process. The families would come in and they would leave in two, three hours. All the agencies would have obtained all the information they wanted without traumatizing uh, the child to a great extent. So as a result, this model uh, evolved and uh, Department of Justice took responsibility uh, of supporting this model. And now Department of Justice funnels funds to an NGO called National Children's Alliance, uh, under which all child protection centers pretty much reside. Uh, and they apply to National Children's Alliance for grants on the projects they're working on, and National Children's Alliance provides them with funds that come from Department of Justice. How does the center look like at a local uh, setting? Uh, the um, most well-developed center in Iowa is uh, at St. Luke's Hospital out of Hiawatha. Uh, and this center is a tiny little campus of its own. Uh, and um, children and families are brought to the center by uh, referrals from either law enforcement or Department of Human Services. Um, the center has its own trained forensic interviewers, trained doctors, uh, child advocates. Uh, they uh, contract with therapists in the community, etc. So when a family comes in, trained people interview the families uh, in the presence of law enforcement and or Department of Human Services. Uh, trained forensic interviewers interview the child alone in a room. Uh, which is recorded, and the recording is intercom to a different room where law enforcement, prosecution, social services may be sitting and watching. And in the end of the forensic interview, if not all of the questions that the agency workers need to hear the answers of, uh, they uh, tell the forensic interviewer, you need to ask this and that, I need this information as well. So as a result, the child doesn't have any contact with the law enforcement or social services, etc. cetera. Uh, the child is only in contact with a doctor and with a forensic interviewer who knows how to speak child language, as one of my colleagues from Turkey had said. Um, so this is what Child Protection Center is. As a result, uh, the recorded forensic interview is provided to law enforcement and uh, social services. In some cases, this saves the child from even going to court to testify before the uh, accuser or accused, the perpetrator, uh, but not always because, you know, um, the defense has the right to face his or her uh, accuser in our law. Uh, and finally, both the non-offending family members and the child are referred to therapeutic services. Uh, and the child advocates also monitor all the legal processes and child protection processes through the child protection centers. Uh, as a result, child protection centers are a wonderful model uh, to manage, especially sexual abuse. And now the follow-up to that question is also, how might, might child protection centers different, differ in different cultures? And along with that, I'm going to ask a couple of that were together, kind of similar, I should say. One is, can you comment on abuse versus cultural norm, and are there significant differences in the definition of child abuse between countries? So let's keep these. Yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, so uh, child protection centers differing from culture to culture is a beautiful question. Uh, it does. And actually, child protection center model has a beautiful flexibility. Uh, even in the United States, every community has its own child protection center model. The core being multidisciplinary approach, multi-agency approach to uh, sexual abuse. Uh, in some settings, prosecution is also present. In some settings, not. Uh, in Turkey, for instance, this is what we did. Turkish law mandates that when there is a sexual abuse allegation, prosecutor must interview the victim. So the victim must tell the prosecutor that she or he was sexually abused. And we were thinking, so what are we going to do? Child Protection Center model in the United States mostly brings together law enforcement, Department of Human Services, doctor, forensic interviewer in the diagnostic process, but no prosecutor, mainly. So we were wondering, what are we going to do? We're going to interview the child in the Child Protection Center, but then the prosecutor is going to question the child. So it doesn't make sense. So we had multiple communications, and this interministerial uh, higher counsel was extremely helpful. Uh, and an order came from up above to the uh, county uh, district attorney's office, pretty much, that find out a solution, uh, create a call system for a select number of prosecutors. There will be a prosecutor going to the Ankara Child Protection Center every day. So as a result, prosecutor is now also sitting behind the uh, two-way mirror listening to the forensic interview, and when the forensic interviewer comes out and uh, tells, already the prosecutor knows what has been shared during the forensic interview, forensic interview sits down, uh, sorry, um, prosecutor sits down with his secretary and dictates to the secretary what the child said as if the prosecutor has obtained the statement from the child. Of course, the pro forensic interviewer is also trained by us. You must stand by the prosecutor because we bet the prosecutor is going to miss a lot of items because he focuses on the criminality of the situation, whereas we would like child protection issues and advocacy issues, everything to get on that particular uh, statement. So as a result, the forensic interviewer and the pr uh, prosecutor dictate that letter, and everybody observing the interview signs the letter in the end, uh, which then becomes the prosecutor obtained the statement from the victim. And that's how we resolve this, for instance. In Portugal, on the other hand, they decided uh, the uh, Institute of Legal Medicine chapters would be their child protection centers. But in Portuguese law, judge has to hear from the child what the child went through. So they worked quite a bit. Eventually, they arrived uh, at a solution that the prosecutor would be present there the way we handled in Turkey. But then the CD would go to the judge's office, and the judge would uh, decide uh, based on um, what was documented on the CD. So it is indeed uh, true uh, that from um, country to country, and even from locality to locality, child protection center model uh, varies. So abuse versus norm. This is a very important question too. In terms of sexual abuse, there is very little modification. Every uh, society that I worked in pretty much understands that if an adult touches a child's genitalia, this is not normal. It is unacceptable. I don't know. There may be societies where this may be part of uh, their norm. At least I'm not uh, aware of that. But physical abuse and neglect uh, vary a lot from society to society. In Turkey, for instance, neglect is the most difficult 
child abuse category to handle because of poverty, because of a variety of uh, cultural differences from one end of the country to the other, uh, what is neglect for us here in the United States is not neglect at all. Children walking on the street, um, you know, barefoot in the middle of the winter uh, with inappropriate clothing, uh, even children begging on the streets, um, social services do not have enough staff to reach out to uh, those individuals. Part of the variation uh, of definition of abuse from one society to the other depends on resources too. We are a very resource rich country, although we're complaining that we don't have uh, enough resources, which is true also. Uh, but um, in a country like Turkey, 73 million population has 3,000 social workers altogether. In Iowa, I'm pretty sure for 3 million we have uh, close to 3,000 uh, social workers. And we still think, you know, uh, it is very difficult to be a social worker in Iowa, which is true. Uh, and as a result, what does the culture do? It drops the more acceptable or tolerable items that actually should not be uh, tolerable. And uh, another thing, I know Turkey very well. Turkey um, has a lot to go in democracy. It still is a police state, I must say. The volume of the police in the country, volume of the prosecutors uh, are huge compared to the volume of the social services. Uh, actually, our work has been influential in that area as well because uh, the mandatory reporting in Turkey is to the police. Not necessarily the policymakers are expecting the police are going to handle child abuse issues, but because police force is the largest force, whereas social services force is minuscule. Uh, so with our teaching, we must report child abuse to social services because police look at child abuse and neglect from criminal perspective. If there's no criminality, they just drop the case, close the case, no rehabilitation, no social services are provided as a result of that. Uh, and because of that, most likely, um, now there are uh, six schools of social work and the number of social workers graduating is increasing exponentially. I hope this was enough of an answer. So this was uh, differences in the definition of child abuse between countries. That is true. Um, actually, World Health Organization uh, has defined all cat four major categories of child abuse and neglect beautifully. But unfortunately, uh, countries are either very vague in their definition of child abuse and neglect, even as the umbrella definition of child abuse and neglect. For instance, in Turkish uh, law, until recently, it was child abuse and neglect covered children who needed protection. Protection from what? No definition of such. In 2006, for the first time, sexual abuse was defined in much more detail, again in criminal context, because sexual abuse, whatever it may be, goes into uh, criminal proceedings. But still, we don't have the definition of physical abuse, we don't have the definition of neglect, we don't have the definition of psychological abuse in Turkish law. And uh, in many other countries I've been to, these clear definitions also lack, partly because they don't know what it is, partly because professional awareness is not as high as it is uh, in the US, uh, and partly because it's not priority for uh, policymakers, unfortunately. Well, in talking about policymakers, that fits into the next question, which what were the reasons certain cities or governments gave which did not want to participate in your efforts? Good question. First, let's start from Turkey. Um, before I left Turkey in 1998, I had worked with two very brilliant 
administrators and academics within the Ministry of Health then, uh, in 1998. Um, one of them had established a child abuse bureau within the ministry, just on paper, uh, and uh, the other one provided a scholarship for me to come to the U.S. to do a fellowship on child abuse and neglect at Ohio State University. So my goal was to be able to go back to Turkey, and I was promised by these two wonderful individuals, we're going to pull you to the headquarters of the ministry and we'll start working on a national program on the management of child abuse and neglect. So I was very hopeful. But when I was here, elections took place, fundamentalist religious group entered a coalition with the Social Democrats and the Ministry of Health was given to the fundamentalists. So uh, one of the first things the fundamentalists did that I heard was the elimination of the Child Abuse Bureau, which was simply on paper. Nothing was done. So that was quite telling. And when I was trying to figure out whether I'm going to go back to Turkey or whether I will stay here for an academic position, then to launch on something significant in the country, uh, some of my support people told me, forget about the Ministry of Health. For some time, nothing is going to come out of uh, that place. That's what made me decide I need to stay uh, in this country. Um, <clears throat> the second time I came into contact with Ministry of Health was around 2005, 2006, and one of my collaborators brought uh, together a group of uh, Ministry of Health people who were fundamentalists and Turkish nationalists. So politically, had they known where I stood, I'm pretty sure they wouldn't have even met with me. But uh, we had a very professional conversation. Uh, the first question was, who's going to pay for this? Because my proposal was, why don't we consider within one of the Ministry of Health hospitals to establish a child protection center? Of course, that would require trained doctors, trained forensic interviewers, etc. So I said, well, you know, at this point, if Ministry of Health would be willing, it would have to come from Ministry of Health employees. Some employees would need to be designated. So that pretty much was a dead discussion. I knew it. And from that point on, they didn't even consider uh, meeting with us. So they made it look like it was a money issue, but in fact, it was a we can't go into the family business issue, in my mind. Sexual abuse was a taboo in Turkey until these very high profile uh, scandals uh, started erupting. That was the major uh, barrier, uh, I'm pretty sure. And we experienced the same thing um, in Portugal and uh, Greece as well. There were several questions asking about kind of prevalence. And so um, statistically, what tends to be the frequency of child abuse in the United States as well as other countries, and kind of the distribution across different categories of sexual abuse, neglect, uh, drugs, multiple type abuse, and is it more common in some cultures? And do you see that increasing or decreasing? Great. Thank you. In the United States, um, every year about two and a half million children are reported for alleged abuse and neglect. Uh, about uh, six to eight hundred thousand children are substantiated to be victims of uh, a variety of abuse and neglect. Um, at the national level, two thirds of all substantiated cases uh, are done so because of neglect. Neglect is the biggie. In Iowa, eighty percent neglect. Um, Physical abuse is the second in line. Sexual abuse is less. In Iowa, physical abuse is 9 to 10 percent, 4, 5 percent sexual abuse. And uh, we have about 7, 8 percent psychological abuse. Uh, and drug exposure is about 5 to 7 percent. Um, so these are American numbers. So we have all the statist statistics that we need. And the good news is, in the United States, sexual abuse and physical abuse are declining. Uh, over the last decade, which is a good thing because of all these interventions that we have uh, in place. 
In Turkey, we don't have such good numbers because um, there is no mandate to file a report for child abuse to social services. The mandate is to law enforcement, and law enforcement uh, is handling child abuse management in a terrible manner. If there is no criminal side to it, cases are closed without substantiation. Uh, but from field studies, we know that about one-third of children are physically abused in Turkey. We know that more than half the children are neglected in the way we understand it in the United States, not necessarily in the way it's understood uh, in Turkey. And uh, in terms of sexual abuse, field uh, surveys reveal that it may be anywhere from 10% to 30% of adults reporting having been sexually abused in one form uh, or another. Uh, and um, psychological abuse is not studied pretty much at all uh, in Turkey yet. Uh, I was a scientific consultant with a multi-country uh, research study uh, that was led by Dr. Nikolaidis from Greece um, called BECAN, Balkan Epidemiology on Child Abuse and Neglect. And uh, this study also revealed that of all the Balkan countries, including uh, Turkey, uh, sexual abuse was uh, reported by uh, 10 to 15 percent uh, of children at age 11, 13, and 16 uh, years. Uh, and psychological abuse was reported by more than 50 percent of children. Uh, physical uh, violence was reported, again, uh, close to by 30 uh, percent of the children. So it's a huge, huge emergency. Uh, and uh, we really need to look into uh, all these across the world. Um, we're doing more or less a better job in the U.S., and that's why I want to focus some of my energy on the international arena. What was the other one? It was um, did I not come um, Over time, is child abuse increasing or decreasing? So There's for something. the U.S., I mentioned that neglect is increasing, but uh, sexual abuse and physical abuse are decreasing. Uh, in other countries that I'm working with, I can't say whether it's increasing or decreasing because in order to say that, you have to have reliable data sets over a longitudinal period of time, and these countries do not have that. How have recent political and immigration developments in Turkey affected child abuse issues, and how different, difficult is it to measure the incident of child abuse in different countries? I think you actually just answered that last one, but with the immigration developments in Turkey, what are you seeing? Well, um, the Syrian uh, immigration wave, of course, made things uh, difficult in the country, but not necessarily for the natives. It is extremely difficult for the Syrian refugees. Uh, initially, the current government tried to exploit the Syrian refugees when they first started coming in. Uh, the government would locate them uh, to certain uh, prefabric towns and give them citizenship so that they would vote for the fundamentalist Turkish government. But then, because the wave continued and they decided, you know, they're not going to be able to handle this burden, they just washed their hands off of anything and everything to do with the refugees. So unfortunately, in September, when I went to Turkey, uh, in major city squares, uh, the Syrian refugees were just uh, squatting around with their sacks, their children, uh, families uh, in a very bad situation. Lots of them were begging. Uh, and the government pretty much is not doing much. I don't know if, if, if it had any impact on child abuse and neglect for the natives in the country, but there is big time neglect going on with the Syrian refugee population. So I just heard that there is uh, some funding coming uh, from EU to Turkey to help these uh, populations, which is good news. What percentage of, uh, I think it's of the event, but of the abuse that are brought forward uh, are, go to legal intervention? 
So um, actually in Turkey, majority of the cases that come to surface find themselves into the criminal uh, system. Because of what I described, mandatory reporting is to law enforcement. So law enforcement sees a criminal uh, component in the report, it goes to the criminal system, doesn't see anything of such, it, the case is closed. So as a result of that, pretty much all substantiated cases go to the uh, court system and uh, criminal uh, system. Uh, some cases go to Department of Human Services equivalent uh, agency. They may be removed without necessarily uh, legal action just for rehabilitation uh, purposes. But what the problem for me is, first of all, um, child abuse and neglect is an iceberg in every single country. Uh, it depends on the country's management of child abuse and neglect how big the tip of the iceberg above the water is going to be. So in the United States, the tip of the iceberg is much bigger because we have systems in place. In Turkey, on the other hand, the tip of the iceberg is much smaller and whatever comes out finds its way to the criminal system. But are they handled appropriately in the criminal system? No, because the prosecutors are not well educated to understand child abuse and neglect. The first abusive head trauma case that I had diagnosed, I remember I had told the police this baby was shaken and injured and the police was flabbergasted and said, doctor, I don't see any mark on his face. I said, well, you don't have to. I gave him a mini lecture, but he was like not understanding what was going on. Uh, and another uh, case scenario, a father had abused his twin children, killed one and injured the other one uh, big time. And uh, um, the doctors who had reported this to law enforcement wanted to publish these two cases and uh, asked me to work on this. And I did, but in the end I said, what happened with the court proceedings? They said, well, nothing came out of it. I said, what do you mean? This is textbook case of battered child syndrome. How can it be unconclusive, inconclusive? I said, you know, I'm not going to publish this unless you go back to the prosecutor, talk with the prosecutor, about why this is a battered child and uh, make the prosecutor open another case. And only then it turned into a successful uh, prosecution. Only then we published the case. Uh, but that's what's happening uh, in Turkey, unfortunately, because uh, professional awareness is still not uh, optimal. I think we're about out of time, but I'm going to ask the last one. Is the traditional rivalry between Turkey and Greece hindering this kind of progress? <laughs> and I'm hoping you're, I'm hoping you're an answer on a more positive note. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, actually, um, if the question is regarding me being involved uh, in that, definitely no. Uh, because I am a world citizen and wherever I go, I uh, introduce myself as such. And uh, of course, um, the Greek population is very sensitive, a Turk coming to them to work with them. Where do I stand? They don't know. And I make sure they understand whatever is going on between the governments, the stupid stuff doesn't bind me. And uh, I am there as a world citizen to work with them uh, for the best interest of children and uh, families. And soon we go into political discussions and we discover that we're on the same line and we can uh, go ahead and work together. And another thing is my origins actually are from Greece, uh, the island of Crete. Three of my grandparents were converted Greeks. So that also helps when I introduce myself. I'm the daughter of this land. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. 
Well, we now unfortunately must conclude our program, but on behalf of the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council, I give a big thank you and chok chok te to Dr. Resmie Aral for her presentation. <laughs> I'd also like to thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, and the Stanley U of I Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. And again, we also thank today's financial sponsors, Mike Margolin and Jane McCune. Uh, Resmie, as a small token of our appreciation, we want to present you with our very, very coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. So thank, thank you, you so very much. much. <laughs> so thank you. Great. Beautiful. Yeah, Enjoy it. So thank you very much for joining us today, and we are adjourned. <laughs>